Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you've all recovered from last night's uh, depredations there, and you're all feeling gung-ho for today. I'd like to introduce you for this morning's talk to Russell Curry, and he's going to take us on with the, the colonel. Thank you. Could you put your hands thank together? You. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming out. So, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about Linux kernel testing and how we can head off to the magical fantasy land where everything works and there's no bugs ever. Um, so I work on the kernel. Um, I work at IBM on power system stuff in the kernel. And I'm more of a, you know enthusiastic observer of the testing world. I do some stuff in my spare time. But um, like everyone in the kernel com community, I have a lot of opinions. And so you are going to be blessed with those today. Um, so the key thing I'm getting at, and this isn't going to be, we're going to be talking about the kernel, but I hope there are some takeaways for people who um, aren't involved in the kernel world as well, because the kernel is really big, both in terms of scale of what it does and in terms of the community that works on it. Um, and one of the bigger um, undertones I want to get to today is solving really hard problems with no direct leadership. There's this kind of concept in, usually in team sports, that um, if people are uh, doing a bad idea together is usually better than people doing their own good ideas separately. And while you know, there's places that that doesn't quite line up with the you know, software development community. Um, I think the idea that without anyone from the top down saying we're all going to do X, um, it makes things much more difficult in terms of getting together something that actually works. So let us just go over the problem to solve. We have this immense problem of scale in the kernel community. This is just stats from one kernel release, of course, from LWN, who puts these out every time a new kernel drops. And so in one single kernel release, we have you know, over 14,000 commits, over 1,800 developers, and that's just developers that got commits in that cycle. You know, not every kernel developer always has something ready for a certain release, and, you know, lines of code aren't a great metric, but there's a whole bunch of those as well. So there's a lot of stuff going in all the time, and this is over the span of how long's the kernel release, eight to 10 weeks. So there's a lot of maintainers um, that accept code. Not all of these send code directly to Linus, but you know, you have multi-layers where a maintainer for a small part will approve some code, send it to the next person, send it to the next person, and maybe that person will send it to Linus. So there's a lot of people involved, and maintainers um, don't work in unison. They don't have a one set um, set of guidelines. They each do things in their own individual ways, which means that the communities that end up working on those subsystems operate in different ways. And this can be something like the networking subsystem having their own bizarre ideas about um, comment syntax, and there's other things that get a bit more serious. So um, you don't have a unified front across the kernel. Things work in different ways. You know, some maintainers don't use Git for some reason. So um, there's a lot of kernel versions out there if you're talking about testing, if there's a bug, where it might be, and where it might be caught. Um, so if you go to kernel.org today, um, these are the currently supported releases from the kernel community. This is where the kernel community posts their, you know, yes, we are supporting these kernel versions. Um, the problem with that is, has anyone ever actually run a kernel they got from kernel.org directly, especially on any machine they actually use and care about and need to run? Okay, more than zero. That's impressive. So no one actually really uses these things because people use distributions, and distributions are fantastic until you realize that you've just multiplied your problem a whole bunch because now you have versions of these distros and subversions of those kernels in those distros. They each ship different configs, maybe not what's default upstream, maybe not what kernel developers and testers are actually running. Um, oh, yeah, and this is the main pain point. They put a whole bunch of stuff on top of that that... Um, wasn't originally upstream, sometimes rather drastically. The biggest one I can think of is whatever Red Hat release had a 3.10 kernel, um, and then you know, for hardware support, they decided that that needed the USB 3 stack that went into 3.18, which was like two years later, and so you end up with these franking kernels for long-living distributions, um, and yeah, sometimes they backport heaps of stuff. So you can get how this is getting kind of insane at this point to get a handle on, on what we need to test for. Um, and then you stop and think, Linux isn't just any old software project that you just type make check and you get you know, a good suite of results with perfect coverage. It's a, it's a kernel, so it interacts with hardware. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but there's actually a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of different hardware, like CPU architectures are fundamentally completely different hardware. Um, and you have revisions of those, you can have CPUs with different extensions 
um, supporting different things, different revisions of their instruction set. You have um, different MMUs. Um, you can have big endian and little endian, sometimes within the same architecture. All of these are pain points of PowerPC because we have different ones of all of these. We have like five MMUs. I don't know why. Um, and there's also all these devices. You have USB and PCI and all these wonderful things um, that you need to make sure you don't break. Some of them can come and go, so you have to not break hot plug. Most of them, I don't know about most of them, plenty of them do you know, stupid things that you then need quirks for. So you know, this, is, this is pretty difficult. And oh yeah, user space, which infamously you're never allowed to break. So you get what I'm getting at. This is, this is really hard. All you need to do is this. Um, the matrix of all hardware, software, and kernel versions, and you just test those with perfect test coverage, and then nothing will ever break. The problem is that, obviously, oh, since I've been here, a whole bunch of patches just hit the list, so we've got to test those as well. And you get the idea that um, all the resources in the world wouldn't be able to do this. And then you think, okay, well, what exactly are we testing for? What does it test? We've well, got to make sure it builds, um, which might sound like a low bar, but a lot of people don't test this. Um, <laughs> You've got warnings, so not just compiler warnings, but you know, we're going to run some static analysis tools, things like spars that tell you things that the compiler might not by itself. You have to test for regression. So everything it's ever done, make sure it still does those things. I hope you didn't just make it slower. That's not going to be good for our client because they just lost 0.5%. Um, and security is somewhat important, as you may have heard. So OK, that's a lot of stuff to test for. Um, so it's not possible. Um, there's always going to be a compromise. We just have to do the best we can with this insane matrix that we have, um, which we might have a better job of doing if we were somehow a unified front, but we're not. We're all off in different corners doing our own thing, often silently. So let's break things down a bit. I've just told you everything's impossible. How do we kind of get a, a handle on it? Well, I'm going to go through the life cycle of some code that gets submitted to the Linux kernel. Um, so whether it's a patch, a, a series of patches, uh, that culminates in a commit in the Git tree that um, ends up being used by people eventually. So let's go through the life cycle of some code that gets submitted to the kernel. Um, so a developer sends a patch. You know, this could be you, this could be someone you know and love. Um, and they, they send some code to the Linux kernel. Um, how much do you think they've tested it? Does anyone want to suggest? How much has someone tested a bit of code they've just sent? Not at all. Not at all. Sometimes, but usually probably none. Um, so, you know, we're already starting with a low bar. And the developer's the hardest one to fix because there's thousands of these people. Um, so it's hard to just change what every single individual developer does because there's just too many of them. Um, so what could they run themselves? You know, sometimes they will do this. A lot of times they won't do this. But what can we reasonably expect a developer to actually do? Um, well, they might run check patch, um, and you can set up a Git hook that automatically check patches for you, so you have no excuse. And that sort of saves you from the baseline level of flaming. Um, you might check that it compiles. Of course, you'll only check this on the compiler that you have for the you know, computer, you know, your architecture that you have. But you'll probably compile it. You might boot it. And then um, if we're really, really going somewhere extra, we might. Um, if you're working on a specific subsystem and that subsystem has a known test suite, you might even run that. So that's, that's not bad. So that's kind of the dream case. So I'm going to quickly talk about the type of thing we might expect people to run at sort of the developer stage. So you've got self-tests. The key thing about self-tests that make them great is that they're in the kernel tree, which means that they're not something to the side that people are going to forget about. Um, they're actively maintained in theory. So um, you build the self-tests. You run them in user space once you've booted your kernel. Um, need root, but that doesn't matter because if you've booted a kernel you've just built, you probably have root. And sometimes they have a kernel module that they can talk to to access some functionality within the kernel. So self-tests are good. The issue is that there's a lot of them. Um, there's heaps and heaps of them. And self-tests are supposed to be small and, and well-contained and all that stuff, but they're not all super fast. And when you have a whole bunch of not-so-super-fast self-tests, no one's ever going to run them all. So the best you can kind of hope for is that people are going to run the self-tests for whatever thing they're touching. So um, can we expect developers run them all? No, just maybe some in their area, which is, which is all right. So we've at least got some tests going. They're centralized. They're maintained in the kernel. This is a good start. Um, KUnit, I'm sure plenty of you were at Brendan's talk yesterday, but now we can do unit tests in the kernel. How cool is that? Um, so the issue is obviously it's only just hit. It's brand new. There aren't a ton of test cases. Um, will developers actually run these before they send code? I think um, maybe, uh, 
but not for a while, right? We've got to wait until there's more publicity, people are more used to it, more tests get written. Um, I think yes, because they're quick, but I think we're, we're, we're a ways away from that. But that's a, a solid work in progress here. So uh, they've done this testing, and the code is now on the mailing list. It's out there in the public. People are ready to flame them. Um, so we hope that they've tested you know, stuff like sanity checks, and it probably probably does the thing it's supposed to do. Not always. I've seen plenty of cases where it doesn't and could never have done the thing it's supposed to do. But usually people, people do this. Um, and it's at this point that any problems with the code are the responsibility of the author. If the author doesn't fix them, the code won't be accepted. So, um, so what, what happens next? You send, you do a bad code. Your code goes on the mailing list and it's got a big problem. It doesn't compile or something like that. Um, what's the first thing you hear? What's the first email you get? Yes, uh, you get this. You get the attack of the robots. Um, you get bombarded by a fleet of bots telling you that um, you made a grave mistake. They actually say it in very nice language now, um, really thanking you for your contribution, despite it not compiling. So <laughs> the first thing you'll hear is, is the robots. And there's a, there's a few robots. You get some automated replies. There's a few things that send it. It's a zero-day bot. That's the cable test robot. Um, that's run internally at Intel. There's Cookie from Red Hat. There's another one or two that I've forgotten. There's Snowpatch, which I wrote, which doesn't actually send email yet. That's still in a branch, but you know, I hope that it would by the time I gave this talk. But anyway, it's getting there, and there's more. There's actually quite a few more robots that are running stuff um, on every patch, but they're not all sending email, and they're not all pu publishing the results publicly. Um, there's a lot of this stuff happening inside inside companies trying to catch stuff that they care about. So what kind of stuff do robots do? Well, they usually compile, um, which is sometimes more than developers. Um, and they build on a few different platforms, which is really key. Um, it's extremely common that developers will break things like 32-bit support. They'll break things for different endianesses. They'll um, do those kinds of things because they are out of mind and not what that developer cares about. So they'll usually build on a few different platforms, run some static analysis is a pretty common one. Um, in some cases, they boot things. Booting untrusted code off a mailing list isn't the most terrific idea, but usually you know, in, in Quemu or something, this will happen. And there's also ones that do some fancy performance stuff and will for every patch tell you if it's regressed performance in something by however many percent, but these aren't usually public. Um, so, what more can we get the robots to do? What more can we do to support the robot uprising? Well, it needs to be inexpensive, because if it's not inexpensive, then these are going to get backlogged. There's a lot of patches to test that are just hitting the mailing list. So it needs to be inexpensive, um, because otherwise it defeats the purpose if it's three days later that you get an email. So um, make sure we all do some basic sort of boot testing. Um, Context-aware self-test, so looking at the area that the patch is in, um, seeing if there's a self-test suite for that area. Maybe when you boot it in Quemu, you run these self-tests. Um, KUnit is a perfect thing that should be pretty inexpensive for robots to do. Um, and publish results. This is something that we're kind of working towards in the kernel test community, but um, more public publishing of results and a more centralized place for them to go. So that's kind of the next step for, for the robots. Um, also, if, you ever, if you're hearing this and being like, oh, I want to run something on every patch, uh, Use that, the thing in pink. I wrote that, so did Andrew. It's pretty cool. I gave a talk on it last mini conf if you're interested. So the code has satisfied the robots. You've got no emails, which usually means things are going pretty sweet. Um, what happens now, um, next thing you get is usually your friendly neighborhood um, mailing list lurker who will um, you know, point out that you, know, you could probably use an extra space in there somewhere. So humans are looking at it at this point, um, and humans um, are quite good at finding issues, not necessarily the important ones, but <laughs> humans are now looking at it. And so now we answer, you know, the persona of a reviewer. Um, now, this is assuming humans actually do look at it. Um, I found this figure that 2% of patches are completely ignored. Does anyone have a, want to take a stab at if we're getting better or worse at this over time? Is this number going up or down? It's going down. We're actually getting much better at this. It was at like 4% at you know, 2011, and now it's below 2%, I think, now. So we've gotten better at this. I think it's partially due to um, a better tool and more adoption of stuff like Patchwork that can keep track of this stuff. So, you know. um, some guys put every email 
on kernel mailing lists and did a whole bunch of analysis. There's an LWN article about it. Some people just wrote a paper on kernel email. So that's how they did it. Um, um, I'm not sure. Um, so some uh, reviewers looked at it now. So uh, what kind of test does a reviewer run? They're probably going to, if, if it's a bit suspect, they might go, hmm, I don't want this to break my thing. Let me check if this breaks my thing. So they might test it on their thing. Um, they might think, hmm, this interacts with this other subsystem. I bet this person hasn't tested it. So maybe I'll do that. Um, more realistically, they're just going to say, are you sure this works on such and such? I don't really want to check, but are you sure? Um, so reviewers aren't really going to add anything here. There's not really much that the reviewer is going to do. So um, <laughs> we've made it past the reviewer. Now the maintainer is going, oh, yeah, I'll merge this so this person stops e emailing me. So um, the maintainer has a lot of responsibility. The maintainer doesn't want to break things in their tree. Um, the maintainer is probably the first person to actually run some proper tests. Not specifically on your patch, but they'll probably take everything they're considering for the next merge window, bundle it together, and see if anyone's horribly broken the world. So the maintainer's probably going to run some, some actual stuff. Um, but maintainers are really busy, and they're not perfect, so you know, not everything gets caught at this stage. Um, and it's kind of at this point that bugs get reported to the maintainer. They will probably forward it on. But it tends to be at this point that if there's a bad thing in some subsystem, that the subsystem maintainer gets notified. Um, and as I mentioned before, maintainers do different things. They kind of each operate the way that they want to. And this includes stuff like you know, using tools like GitLab or Garrett instead of, instead of mailing lists. There's a lot more maintainers kind of experimenting with different stuff. So um, the tests that they run, not every maintainer is even going to run tests. I mean, I'm sure they do something. but. They're probably at least going to run whatever they have set up for the subsystem they maintain. If you've got a graphics maintainer, you're going to test some graphics. If you've got audio maintainer, you're going to test some audio, and so on. So we've got that much going for us. Um, a quick mention, what if there's conflicts with other trees? So each maintainer's kind of taken in what they're taking for their subsystem. Um, what if there's a conflict between them that are unresolved? Well, thankfully, we have um, just a quick mention of Linux Next. Um, so Linux Next mashes all the maintainer trees together before they go to Linux to see if there's any conflicts and gets those people to sort of figure it out between themselves before everything goes to Linus. Um, this is run by a nice man in Canberra named Stephen Rothwell. And people don't tend to test Linux next. And maybe they don't test it as much as they should. Um, people do run tests on it, but because of the volatility, because of the amount of code in there that hasn't been together before, um, because of how often stuff gets put in and taken out, um, it's kind of volatile. And so not a lot of testing happens at this stage. Um, some does, but not the kind of in-depth stuff you might want. So uh, the code's gone to the maintainer. The maintainer's merged it into their tree. They've sent it to Linus, and Linus has taken it. So uh, it's upstream. You know, we're going to be in the next release. We've made it. Our patch has hit the big time, sort of. So kernel testing's kind of hard. So thankfully, um, you know, Linus doesn't just publish that as the release. We have, you know, release candidate one and release candidate two. And so we have, you know, roughly, you know, RC7, RC8 before the kernel actually comes out. And on every one of those, Linus usually says, please, for the love of God, test this thing. Um, so we're probably going to run some big tests now, because the scope has been greatly narrowed. We know, generally, the base we're going on. We're just taking you know, 5.5 RC1 or whatever, and we're going to run tests on that. So um, we've narrowed the scope. We're not testing a billion different sets of code. We're kind of just testing one one thing. So we could run some bigger stuff now. From this point, once you've made it to a release candidate, there's only fixes coming in. There's no new functionality. Sometimes stuff will get taken out, but generally, um, generally stuff's just fixes going in. So, and a lot of people are uh, testing stuff at this point. Um, and the more people you have, the more hardware you have, the more different configs people are trying. There's generally more stuff happening. Um, the problem is that, wait a minute, so some kernel developers are doing something, but who uses upstream kernels again? Has anyone ever run a release candidate on their laptop? One guy, you're a saint. So um, no one really does this, so there's still a lot of stuff that isn't, isn't happening. So I'm going to give a shout out to kernel CI here, and the, this is, you know, the release candidates are kind of some of the, the level at which um, kernel CI starts to kick in. So kernel CI was originally designed to test um, a whole bunch of different ARM boards. You had this issue where you have all these little embedded chips, and you want to make sure that none of them break. And so they got a big library of these and 
put some magic together to automatically test them all. Since then, it's kind of grown. It's got a lot more than just ARM on there now. And they're kind of focused on you know, master, stable, and some main chain entries. The breadth that they have is more in the hardware area um, than testing every single patch and whatnot. But this is the level where stuff like kernel CI starts to get in to catch stuff. Um, and yeah, they're mostly just building and booting. So <laughs> here's one issue I'm pointing out is that um, a lot of stuff is happening inside every company. They want to know what's coming next. They want to make sure that whatever hardware they produce, sometimes whatever software they produce, still runs on whatever Linux is doing now. So a lot of stuff is happening inside every company, but we don't necessarily know what it is. Um, we haven't necessarily been given that information. So there are going to be people finding stuff and not reporting it to the right place. There are going to be people um, finding the same stuff, reporting bugs in two different places and so on. Uh, so lots of stuff's happening, but not a lot of results getting pushed out. Um, when I talk to the kernel CEO guys, they always seem keen to be the central place that everyone pushes stuff. So um, that's kind of the way forward for this, is if we can kind of convince people to open up the results of their tests, then we've always kind of loosely agreed on sort of a centralized place to, to have that infrastructure. So you've made it through the release candidates. Nothing's horribly wrong. Um, the code has made it to a release. Um, you know, you have successfully written code that's been released in a kernel tagged by Linux 12 volts that's now out there. It's now joined the list. So now will someone use it? Um, kind of, actually. People might actually start using it now. So cutting edge distros will pick it up pretty quick. You know, your archers, your gentoos, some power users will pick it up because especially people looking for stuff like um, uh, open source graphics driver performance are always hugging the, the latest. Um, some companies will start picking it up if you know, especially if they've sponsored some development of something and then they really want to have that once it's in. So people are starting to use it now. And it's at this point that so-called normal people um, start actually using it. Bugs are being reported by end users. They're not going to development mailing lists usually. They're definitely not going directly to um, developers. They're getting posted on Bugzilla's or whatever. So at <clears throat> this point, People are actually starting to use it. Let's start talking about some, some sort of big out there test projects. So the first one I bring up is, is LTP. Um, I was in a room at um, Linux Plumbers Conference in Lisbon, Portugal last year, where you know, we sat around with a whole bunch of kernel testy CI people to agree on some common ground. And everyone agreed that, all right, if you want a test to be run, put it in LTP. The Linux test project, LTP, is the thing that we've all decided that, yes, if we care about one test suite, it's this one. So if you want a functional test suite, this is the one. It does lots of stuff. It's pretty fancy. You can configure it to do all sorts of stuff. But at the same time, it's, it's kind of complex, and it's not the thing that developers are going to run themselves. So um, there's also fuzzing happening all the time. So syscaller is a, a syscall fuzzer that finds an absolute buttload of bugs. The issue is that fuzzing takes time, so it's not, only, not always going to find things right away. Um, triage is hard because it does find false positives sometimes. It also finds a whole bunch of bugs, and you have to feel, figure out which ones are actual bugs, but that's always going and doing cool stuff. There's also Fuego for um, if you have a whole bunch of embedded devices inside your company and you want to be able to automatically test them all, that's what Fuego does. Um, so it's designed for hardware makers. And there's also Lava. I don't know the in-depth details of these. They sound pretty similar to me, but apparently you can even make them work together. So look into those if you make hardware. So. Not only has our code been released, but now a distro is going to use it. Maybe a big distro that people use. Um, they're going to make a new release, you know, Ubuntu 20, whatever, um, and they're going to use the new kernel version. So this is the point where maybe a lot of people are going to use your code. So this is the point where if a distribution is going to release, they're going to have their own internal test teams that are going to start testing it. And they're going to have run through a suite of stuff. You know, if you're Ubuntu, you're going to test desktop stuff. You're going to test server stuff and Kubernetes and all that. All that stuff the kids are talking about. So um, this is the point where you're getting even more users because some will try it before it's stable and out. People will pick up you know, the betas of these. So people are actually starting to use it now. And it's at this point that bugs get reported to distribution. So there's another layer of indirection before a bug gets reported to the person who was actually capable of fixing it. Um, bugs are reported to distributions. The distro might report it further up. The distro might have someone who works for the distro um, fix it themselves quickly put that fix into their kernel and then maybe send it upstream later, maybe not send it upstream at all. So it's that point that this, we have this additional layer of indirection. Um, and now, you know, end users, common people, you know, your parents are running the code. Um, 
Are there any bugs left? Did we miss anything? We did all this testing, all these different stages. It's been months and months. Are there any bugs left? Maybe. Um, how many different places could we have caught bugs? Like, I don't know. Didn't count them. But there's a lot of places. There's a lot of people, a lot of eyes, a lot of robots, a lot of time. Um, and obviously, people know that there are, have in fact been bugs before. So we're clearly not perfect. Um, so quickly, I'm just going to talk about some, some problems we've run into thus far. So first, we have this, this shifting responsibility. And I don't know if this is a problem that has a solution, but it's just one of the reasons that it's difficult. You have this shifting responsibility between someone's found a bug. Um, how do we get this information to the person who can actually fix it? And as time goes on, that gets harder and harder. This is part of the reason why it's a very common idea in the software development world that you know, the cost of finding a bug is so much lower if you do it early on than later on. So uh, every layer of indirection means there's more delays, there's more confusion, there's more risk that it's kind of lost in, in the list. Um, the test result visibility, as I mentioned before, not only is there a lot of stuff that isn't public, but stuff's in different places. People don't know where to look for test results. Um, you know, people who are running tests don't necessarily have the time to triage every single bug they find. And it's computer stuff. Stuff breaks for no reason all the time. You know, <laughs> it's hard to, you know, always track down actual bugs and then follow through reporting them to the right place. So um, it's not just the lack of visibility, but it's also the lack of centralization. There's the lack of one place people know to go to look for this stuff. There's a big duplication of effort. There's different test projects doing similar things in two separate streams. You have a whole bunch of different companies running stuff internally um, that aren't working together. So there's a lot of duplication of effort. And obviously, if those people work together more tightly, maybe we could test some more stuff. Um, there's a lack of communication. And I don't just mean um, between between companies or test projects, but there's a lack of communication with across the community with its own understanding of itself. There's a lack of understanding of um, what the goal is, where stuff should go, what people are doing. Um, there's no designated responsibility. You'll do this, you'll do that. People are kind of just doing their own thing for the most part and hoping that if they're doing something good, other people will notice. So there's a lack of centralization of um, assigning responsibility and publishing results. Um, but we do find a lot of bugs, all right? We, you know, bugs get through, but we probably caught a whole bunch of them in this process. So you know, we've done all right with what we have. It certainly could be much worse. So back to Portugal, um, where you can buy beer just by pressing a button on a McDonald's screen. And um, Dimitri gave this talk about kernel workflow problems. And some of this was about testing in CI, but a lot of it was just about you know, kids these days don't like sending patches through email. It's really confusing. If you go to the Kernel Newbies Wiki and you go to how to send your first patch, it's like a book. And no one wants to read a book. They just want to fix something. So there was this big discussion. And um, there was a lot of people in the audience. And everyone had opinions. And um, there were so many opinions that Maintainer Summit shortly after had this as like a central topic to talk about amongst the kernels maintainers. Um, People in the Maintainer Summit had opinions. I wasn't there. I'm not important. But um, I was told opinions were had. Um, and then we had this workflows mailing list that got set up. So the community is going to get together and figure out how do we solve the issues of the kernel workflow. Um, so does anyone have any guesses? No cheating for people who have actually read the list. What happened in that mailing list? There's a lot of, OK, people, people posted a lot of stuff. There's a lot of noise. Um, but of course, no one actually did anything. Um, there are a lot of big, big opinions, a lot of pie in the sky ideas, um, but no one really did anything. Um, a lot of people complaining that there should exist things that did, in fact, already exist. They just weren't aware of them. Um, my friend Daniel Axton did a proof of concept for someone asking how they would do something, and then you know they never actually tried to do anything with it after someone did write it. So nothing, nothing really happened there. So I had a few takeaways from from what I've witnessed and what happened here. The first is that everyone's open to collaboration. This is kind of the, the upside of, of the picture. Um, everyone's open to collaboration, at least you know, for all the people doing test stuff publicly. Even if they are kind of doing their own thing in their own space, everyone wants to work together. We're all trying to solve the same problem. So um, maybe it takes some initiative to make that start happening. But everyone is open to collaboration. There's no 
tribalism or anything from what I've seen. Everyone's just keen to work together. Um, actions speak much, much louder than words. So, um, you know, when you have a mailing list that has a whole lot of words and not a whole lot of actions, sometimes it's better to just do a proof of concept, show people, and then see the way forward. Um, it gets to a point where open, as great as openness is, Sometimes big open discussions just get too sidetracked for anything valuable to come out of them. You know, if there's two people out of 100 talking about some good ideas and everyone else comes in saying that, you know, we should reinvent the workflow to use carrier pigeons, then it's kind of hard to do anything. Um, we need to encourage te testers to publish results, as I've talked about, um, and we need to encourage developers to actually check these. And the way we need to do that is to have a centralized place that people know about that's easy to use. Um, the other thing I want to quickly mention around testing is that we need to incentivize reviewers to review. Um, people have tried different ways of doing this, but you know, um, there's not a whole lot of in incentive for people to take their time to review things. Reviewing something properly is also quite challenging, so that's something we could work on. Um, so this is the ultimate takeaway I've had. It's that the, the magical fantasy land is a trap. We're never going to be able to upend everything I've just talked about and replace it with something new. Um, there's too many people. The scale is too big, both of the project itself and of the community that works on it. Um, the magical fantasy land is a trap, and it's too difficult to attain. So what do we do about this? How do we make this picture look better in future? Well, <sighs> this, this is the key thing. There's still a lot we can do with what we use today. Um, I've worked quite a lot and talked a lot with a lot of people about email because you know I work on a project that test patches that wouldn't need to exist if we all used GitHub. Um, but there is a lot we can do with what we use today. A lot of people aren't aware of some of the automation that we have around this stuff now, but um, Patchwork, as I mentioned before, is a project that indexes emails on a kernel development list or any, any development list that uses email and lets you track state and automatically um, collects series together and does all this fancy stuff. And that's based on 10 years of figuring out how do you actually parse an email it's, it's really hard, and people you know, do not always send coherent, sensible, spec-compliant emails to the kernel mailing lists. So a lot of development has gone into this stuff, and it means there's still a lot we can do with what we use today. It just requires some additional effort, development, coordination. So we don't need to um, replace everything we have, because it's going to be too difficult to do that anyway. But we can still have nice things with what we have today. It just takes some work. Um, we need to focus on what we do in the short term. And that's not to say that we can't change the world of, of kernel testing, because we've already done quite well. But um, in a community that's so large, that's so spread apart, um, it's important to just improve on things gradually and introduce changes we can. Something like KUnit's a great example here, where it's something new, but it's a low barrier to entry, and it can easily fit into the way we develop kernels today. Um, and this is my kind of hopeful idea, as someone who's not a kernel maintainer and is nowhere near as busy. But I think it would be great for maintainers to get together um, at least a few of them, and try to agree on a common goal. It could be something simple like increasing the number of reviews on patches. It could be something simple like um, uh, a better public test suite or a place to publish them, or anything that kind of improves the code quality of the kernel. Um, having people say, okay, we want to focus on this, even just, even just saying it publicly and then trying to encourage people, um, I think could go a long way and kind of trigger in people's minds that hey, we can do something slightly different here. We can improve this process. We don't have to keep doing it the same way if we can do better. Um, I think even just publishing goals is, is more important from a maintainer's perspective than having all the answers and having all the specifics. If you go to a community and you say, hey, this release cycle, we're trying to, you know, our current average of reviewed buys per patch is at blah. We want to increase it to blah. How can we do this? I think we'd get a positive reception. So um, what happens next? So, I've just talked about how um, we have all these problems. We kind of have to keep coping with them anyway. Um, how do we actually go about this? Well, um, there's a few things that are going to happen next. So the first thing is that um, maintainers are experimenting. They're experimenting with quite a lot of stuff, um, usually individually, things like replacing some of the tools we have now. Um, with more modern ones that can make it easier to test things, make it easier to have reviews in one place, and all of this kind of thing. Um, 
So maintainers are experimenting with more stuff, and at least the discussion is starting. I don't know that the discussion in terms of the workflows mailing list has gone well, but at least people are getting this idea that we can change things and we can improve things. Um, a common test result format, so this is a really big one. I mentioned all of these test projects, and there's a whole bunch that are internal to companies as well. Um, if we work on a common test result format, then it's much easier to start producing that centralized place where everyone goes. And this is something people have already started actively working towards. Um, the guys behind Lava and Fuego have already started working on this. And so people are generally agreeing, like, yeah, the easiest thing for us to all have together is a format that tells you what ran. That way, people can consume it. It's a lot easier if we all just output the same thing. Um, we had a talk about, OK, what about pro machine provisioning? That's really hard. You have to get hardware and somehow boot it with your kernel on it. That's really tricky. We, it's very hard to centralize that so we all use the same thing. But the test result format is the first place to start. So people have started doing that. Um, so I mentioned kernelci.org is totally open to being this place that's the centralized place that everyone goes for test results. Um, they've got a schema. Um, as a way to interact with their database and put stuff in there. That's great if you're running your own thing that doesn't quite match, um, doesn't quite match the way they already do things. So they've got a way that you can sort of just put things out there directly into their database that describes what you've tested. So um, pretty much every project can, uh, every test project can adapt what they do to that schema. So this is something moving forward that hopefully we can get more people to do. And then we can start having this place that you just go and you can find out everything you could possibly want to know about how tests are running on something. Um, working within companies, so um, obviously I mentioned a lot of people are testing stuff in isolation, not publishing results. And that means that there's duplication and information lost. Um, so people like me and maybe us um, can start floating the idea out there. You know, I've talked to test teams within my company um, about doing this, and they're open to doing it. They're just not really sure how. They're not familiar with the community projects. So one thing I want to do is help drive that change to you know work with those guys to be able to do this. And hopefully, once a few you know if there's a few big companies that start doing this, start posting their test results from what they're running on their hardware, then maybe we can really get somewhere. So that's just my pile of opinions. Thank you. Uh, if, if any of you have got any questions, if you could just put your hand up and I'll give you a microphone. Here we go. Hi. Um, so, firstly, before my question, um, I just want to show the Colonel Newbies boff that is happening at lunchtime in room nine, I believe. Um, if you are a uh, current uh, Colonel hacker, please come along. If you're a future Colonel hacker, please come along um, and we can have a fun time talking Colonels. Um, so my question is that you mentioned several times that um, one of the issues we face is just general developer, uh, like awareness across the kernel community of the tools yep. and the projects that are already going on. Mm -hmm. um, whether that be you know some of the CI projects, but also stuff like the you know patchwork and yep. other stuff like that. Yep. Do you have any ideas with regards to just sort of you know is there stuff we can do in terms of awareness raising? of um, across, uh, across projects of stuff that's related to CI and testing and all of that? Yep. So I think um, the best way we can um, alert developers to this stuff is to, we have to do it in two ways. It's not just to let them know, it's also to um, show them some tangible value. And the way you do that is say, hey, look at this place. It shows that your code sucks. So. I think we kind of follow the robot model on this. I think um, if we're publishing results to one place, we can, you know, when the robot sends an email, it can link to that and say you can see more here. You can then see all the stuff that's run. Um, that'll show you if there's a test suite that's failing, you're now aware of that. Um, you're now aware that the centralized place exists, the centralized place exists um, that you can go and check how your code is running. So I think that's the way. Um, I mean, I was already going to do this for Snowpatch sending emails to Patchwork, and then you, know, you can go see that you can just always check your patch status, and then maybe things that aren't worth emailing you over, you can also go and see. But I think that pattern is the way we do it. I think it's directly when we find a problem, sending it straight to the developer, showing them what ran, and then showing them a link to where they can see the full story. And I think even if you know, you're a 
magical developer who's never written any bad code that got flamed on a mailing list, um, you always see mailing list activity that's doing the same thing to other people. And so I think that's how we do it. Um, Um, sorry, just to follow up to this. Um, um, I think you have like a get maintainer script or something in the uh, in the kernel tree yep. that prints the maintainer. Yep. It might be a very low hanging fruit to have a get test suite script that prints you out. Hey, these are the things you need to run if you just hacked in that tree. Yeah. So just um, as a thought. So. Yeah. So I mean, get maintainer is a bit cursed, but yeah, I don't I don't mind the idea. Um, for example, in the PowerPC tree, we have a. Um, we have a script that wraps the check patch script with a whole bunch of extra, um, a whole bunch of extra flags that just sort of set the specifics that our maintainer really cares about. And I don't, I think that's a good idea. Um, it's a bit tricky if it's referencing things that are outside of the kernel, um, but for anything that's in the kernel, like this set of self tests or these K unit tests, um, then I think that's a good idea. Um, you know, again, you could add a new script and see if it gets any tractions, but that's, I think that's a good idea. I think that, that could work, yeah. Uh, we've still got another f a few minutes left. Is there a, anybody else with a question? Well, Russell, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's an excellent talk. <laughs> and